You've probably heard by now that we've managed to build a laser censoring 3D printer that can print anything. But how do we go from this to this without spending millions of dollars and having a team of 50 engineers? Well, today I'm going to be telling you all about our journey. Hi everyone, I'm Luke. I'm Henry. I'm Frank. And we're the team behind Micronics. Our journey actually started long before we built our first 3D printer, back when we were students at UW-Madison. Our university's machine shop at the time didn't have any CNC equipment, so we always struggled to make parts for our projects. How hard could it be to just build one in our apartment, we thought. So we began researching and designing a CNC mill. Surplus sites and eBay turned out to be great places to find old new stock, and we even found a table that came off an old drill tap machine. We also ordered half a ton of rectangular steel tubing for the frame of the machine, which got delivered to our apartment on two pallets. Thankfully, our landlord wasn't paying attention at the time. For the next few months, we brought these steel sections to the university shop every night, machining them down and getting yelled at for staying past closing time. Of course, we were strictly following OSHA regulations when putting the machine together. No schematics were ever created for the electronics because that's for people with bad memory. Now, who would have guessed that a wooden apartment building was not built to hold a half-ton CNC on the fourth floor hogging out titanium? The floor kept shaking for some reason, and our downstairs neighbors were not too happy about our broken washing machine. A few months later, we moved to the ground floor, and in 2023, we moved into our current lab. While using our CNC, we've always found it annoying how even the simplest parts take forever to program and set up. Cleaning up and trying to sneak big boxes of metal shavings past our landlord was not always fun. We had an Ender 3 at the time, but wished there was a better 3D printer that could produce robust and used parts. We quickly realized that SLS is the holy grail of plastic printing. But when we saw the price tag of even the cheapest machine, we realized that something needed to be done which brings us to our very first prototype. This prototype is the Ender 3 of SLS printers, and it is probably what the Bedslinger company would come up with when they seal our design. We do have patents pending, so dear established companies, please use your own brains instead of stealing ideas from college kids. This machine consists of a simple 100 millimeter cylindrical piston for the build area, a powder dispenser mounted on a movable gantry, and a laser system moving along the gantry. It's all controlled by a 3D printer control board running Gerbil. The build piston is driven by a ball screw actuator and the build surface is mounted on a swivel joint for leveling. The powder dispenser is a resin printed part that has a flap opening at the bottom. This flap is actuated by the movement of the gantry automatically, which makes the printer kinematically simple. The powder dispenser and build piston worked reasonably well, but overall, this is not a very good design since it is very difficult to use and blasts the laser into the open. We therefore quickly moved to our second prototype, which is fully enclosed. For this prototype, we opted for a more traditional design. It features a 120 millimeter square build area, a Galvo laser, and a gravity-fed powder dispenser that is fixed in place. We also integrated an internal tumbler to depowder the parts after printing. This, spoiler alert, is the first machine that was able to produce a benchy shaped object. One issue that we quickly ran into is the spot size of the laser beam. We wanted to use a diode laser since they offer the highest watts per dollar. However, they have this one very annoying characteristic known as astigmatism, meaning the beam is wider in one direction than the other. As a result, when we tried to focus it, it would form a line instead of a round spot, which is obviously not acceptable. One common method to correct this is to use an anamorphic prism pair. This expands the beam in only one direction, which then allows us to focus it down to a tight spot. Another challenge was the lack of off-the-shelf SLS control boards. The Galvo control boards we were using at the time did not understand step direction signals, so we decided to build our very first custom PCB. Of course, who would have guessed, we used incorrect footprints and had poorly laid out switching converters. The whole board was a mess. But hey, it worked, and you live and you learn. Even though we were able to complete a print, there were still huge issues with this prototype. The heating control was very poor, which caused the parts to warp easily. The integrated tumbler also took up way too much space and added too much complexity to the printer. This brings us to our third prototype. In this version, we switched the powder handling system 
from a traditional gravity-fed system to one where the powder is stored under the build area and lifted using an auger. The entire printer is also heavily insulated to maintain a uniform printing temperature. One of the major challenges of building this prototype was making the auger. We initially tried 3D printing it out of high temperature resin in multiple segments, but quickly realized that this would not be accurate or strong enough. So we bought a super cheap fourth axis and attached it to our CNC. However, due to the length of the auger, it could not be cut while only being supported by its ends. Therefore, we chose to make one out of PTFE. This of course wore down very quickly, but it lasted long enough to survive one print and produced our very first solid benchy. After this, we bit the bullet and paid Zometry $1,500 for 10 augers for future prototypes. After staring at this machine for a bit, we realized that the only things touching the powder are the build plate, build chamber walls, and the air on top. So what if instead of putting the entire thing into what is basically a giant oven, we just heat them directly? This brings us to our fourth prototype. Here, we attached heaters directly to the chamber walls, enclosed the air on top of the powder surface with glass plate, and heated it with halogen lamps. With this design, we were able to reduce our heat up time from 45 minutes to 15, and our average power consumption from 1000 watts to 450 watts. At this point, we also decided it was time to start building our own Galvo system for better accuracy and higher print speeds. Most of the error in our off-the-shelf Galvo comes from the poor quality controller, so that's where we decided to start. Initially, we tried building a digital controller on a breadboard, but quickly realized that the signals from the Galvos are very sensitive to noise and EMI. This caused a lot of inaccuracies. Moreover, programming a microcontroller to run the control loop in real time proved to be quite challenging. Therefore, we went back to the drawing board and started work on an analog control loop. First, we had to measure the open loop response of the Galvo actuator. We did this by feeding the amplifier a sign signal from 1 kHz to 96 kHz with 30 points per decade resolution. We then manually recorded the response amplitude and phase to create a plant model. We noticed a resonance at 16 kHz and 24 kHz and assumed this was caused by the flexibility of the motor shaft. To test this theory, we constructed a finite element model of the motor shaft. By computing the eigenvalue and eigenvector of the mass and stiffness matrix, we were able to obtain the natural frequencies and mode shapes of the shaft. As expected, the natural frequencies of the second and third torsional modes corresponded perfectly to the two peaks in frequency response. After creating and validating our plant model, we designed a controller in Simulink. The controller does most of the critical computations using differential signals, which should theoretically cancel out most of the noise. We first tested our design on a breadboard. After some fine-tuning, we were satisfied with the stability and response. However, when we built the controller onto a PCB, there was a small but noticeable oscillation around the natural frequencies. This perplexed us for a little bit because we didn't change anything when transferring the design onto a PCB. Thankfully, we quickly realized that the harmonics of the switching voltage regulator was what's exciting the torsional modes of the shaft. The reason why this wasn't an issue on our breadboard is because we were using a linear power supply for testing. To overcome this, we first tried adding a simple RC notch filter to the output stage. However, the filter was not only filtering out the resonance, but also messing up the rest of the control loop. Therefore, we decided to switch to a multiple feedback active notch filter to avoid having to retune the entire control loop. After this modification, the controller became very stable and was able to track second order quadratic inputs with zero steady state error. After we figured out the powder handling, heating design, and laser system, the rest was all about testing. We built another five prototypes to optimize the user experience and the assembly process. We then built another 13 machines to run them through their paces. To fully test the machine with different models, we created a print service on our website where you were able to upload your parts to be printed by us. Thanks to you, we were able to print tons of interesting parts that are not only helping us perfect our printers, but are actually going to be used in the real world. After doing a bunch of testing in-house, we decided to deliver one of our beta machines to the UW Makerspace for further testing. I'm here with Matt. We just landed, dropped off our printers. Matt, can you tell us where we are? Yeah, we're at UW Makerspace. Let's open this thing up. Let's, let's open it up. Let's unbox this thing. All right, we got everything unboxed and set out, so let's turn it on.
Matt took a lunch break. We're here with Jason. Our print just finished. Let's take it out. <laughs> Part came out looking good, so let's go ahead and measure it with the caliper, see if it came out accurately. The other parts in the print also looked quite nice. And there we have it, the Micron Desktop SLS 3D Printer. It's coming on Kickstarter in June, starting at $29.99. In the meantime, subscribe and hit that bell notification, join us on Discord, and if you've got a question, leave it in the comments below.